Hello everybody and welcome to this very special um, live stream on lockdown 2.0, what next for workplace mental health. Um, my name is Zoe Sinclair and I am the co-founder of the This Can Happen Workplace Mental Health Conference and it gives me really great pleasure uh, to be joined today by the This Can Happen partners. Um, so welcome today to Monica Misra who is the Head of Health and Wellbeing EMEA at GSK. Hello Monica. Um, we're also joined by Sarah Boddy, who is the Chief Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Officer for EMEA and APAC from Northern Trust. Welcome, Sarah. And we're also joined by Tony Graves, um, Global Head of Rewards and Wellbeing at Allen and Overy. Um, welcome to you all. So we really are on a very amazing <laughs> day, I guess, today. Um, we are going into lockdown here in the UK again for the second time. So Monica, I guess, you know, coming to you first, what, what does the workplace even look like now? Before we even get onto anything else, it, it, it's looking very different to what it looked like eight, nine months ago. Absolutely. And actually, I'm in the workplace today for the first time after eight months. And it, it, it's um, much quieter than it was before. Clearly, we still have our essential workers in the workplace. Um, but mainly, that's really in order for us to continue to produce uh, products for our patients and consumers. So those sites are continue to be busy um, as we need to. Uh, sites where we have offices are, are much quieter because, as you know, people who can work from home are continuing to work from home. And so um, it's a very different feel coming into the office. And um, Sarah, for you, what does, what can we learn from last time? that maybe we can help staff with this time? Yeah, I, I think there's a couple of things. First of all, I think as with most things in life, the second time, the third time, the fourth time you do something or you go through something or you experience something, it's usually somewhat easier than the first time because that degree of the unknown is, is taken out of it or somewhat taken out of it anyway. So I think there is a feeling <laughs> that um, we were there before, we managed to get through it. It was really difficult and very hard, but we did manage to get through it. Um, and that's better prepared us mentally um, for, for getting through it a second time. I think also we, in a sense, knew this was coming for a little longer. There's been talk of a second wave, really from when the first wave hit us, that we would see that in the winter time. Um, and all the countries around us started going into lockdown. So consciously or unconsciously, I think our brains will have been starting to prepare for this um, before the announcement actually came. And I do think both of those things are things that we can take into this second uh, pandemic um, as, as good preparation and good, good things in our mental health that can help us through this period. OK, so that's really useful. And I, and I should have said at the beginning that um, anyone watching on any of the platforms can send in a, a question or comment um, and to post to any of you. And we will come to those shortly. Um, but, Tony, I think it's really interesting what Sarah said, because somebody has said to me that actually they might have been more prepared for it this time. But actually, last time was if I can say slightly adrenaline fueled, we were always we were looking for new ways of working and there was so much to think about. And actually this lockdown now is is has got slightly more of a depressive approach to it. I think we are, yeah, we are definitely seeing that in terms of people's responses, because last time, although there was the initial anxiety about the unknown, as you say, everyone was getting to grips with new technology and new ways of working. And then, of course, you had that period where people really kind of came together to go, you know, we had all the great stories on the news of, you know, Captain Sir Tom doing his walking and just people helping their neighbours, you know, doing their shopping for their elderly neighbours and things like that. And it I really hope some of that comes back, but it doesn't feel as though it's quite there yet. And also, you know, knowing what to expect is a bit of a double edged sword, because I think last time we went into it thinking, oh, we'll all be back in the office by May. Whereas this time we're thinking, well, you know, it's going to be the winter and it's it's six 
long months and, and dark evenings. So I think it's tough for people, definitely. And, um, and Monica, what do you think about that sort of adrenaline fuel first one and that this one is slightly more solemn and subdued? Are you seeing that in your star? I think there's a feeling of chronicity here, similar to what Tony said, is that we, with the first lockdown, it was something that was unique. And now that we've experienced it and we know all the challenges that we faced during the first lockdown, we can foresee that happening again. So I think there is a, a an undertone of this is more like a marathon. And, um, and because of that, it's much potentially harder to get go through it, remembering the challenges that we faced earlier. I think also the, the the unknown in terms of the duration, we're hoping it will be lifted in a month, but we really don't know that. And so that uncertainty factor can also be causing issues. Um, I think the fact that, that also the days are shorter now and, and, and it's much darker sooner, it's much harder to look after your well-being in these situations. So it takes a lot more effort to do so. So interestingly, I was talking to someone recently and they said exactly on that um, point, Monica, about the, the days getting shorter, that they have said to their staff, you know, take out two hours if you want during the day when you have lunch or, or, or when there's light hours. If you need to work later into the night, I don't want you to miss out, especially at this time, on light hours. And I thought that was just a, such a simple message, but something really powerful. Um, so, Tony, you know, turning to you, how, what other nuggets or how can we keep our staff motivated in this second lockdown? Um, so, I think, um, I, I think line managers are obviously really important in terms of staying connected to their teams but we equally have to remember that i think our, our managers are also really quite tired because they've got this additional responsibility um so i think looking after our line managers is quite important um but picking up on your your point about daylight um i think it's quite important for people to understand what their own rhythm is so some people will know that they concentrate really well in the evenings that's not me um, other people will concentrate really well early in the morning so to the extent that you can and that you have a little bit of flexibility in your day you know you can try to work so that you're working when you know you're working at your best um, I do think getting you know getting outside and you know daylight is so important so if you can somehow position where you're working close to a window even if you're sitting on a chair with your laptop on your lap if you're close to a window you're getting more natural daylight um, and yeah try to get out for you know even if it's a short walk I mean we're fortunate in this lockdown that we can you know we can still go outside for exercise and we can also meet one other person outside in a public space. So we're able to do things, certainly that in terms of meeting someone that we couldn't do in the first lockdown. Plus, with the kind of support bubbles and those sorts of things, people can, you know, so two single people can bubble together. You can have a support bubble for informal childcare. There are lots of things in place that we didn't have in the first lockdown that I think we've probably learned. So, you know, we recognise that people could be extremely lonely and very isolated. And I think some of these things will, will really help that. A couple of other things that we've sort of suggested Video calls are great, but I think people are quite fatigued by it now and they tend to get booked back to back during the day. So if you can book your video calls for 55 minutes instead of 60, use that five minutes as you would in the office to walk around to your next meeting, you know, and just do some basic stretches, you know, stretch, stand up, look away from your screen for a little bit. Um, and sometimes think about alternatives to video calls. You know, I've heard lots of people saying that they like to kind of walk and talk. So if it's a one to one, you can do it on the phone instead of a video call and get outside and, and walk while you're doing it. And the interesting thing about that is the quality of kind of thinking and the conversation can actually be really different simply because you're you're walking and talking at the same time because just the simple act of movement can help you to uh, to manage and, and stabilize your emotions actually. 
really invaluable points, um, Tony, actually. I think all of them I haven't even necessarily thought about, but very easy little wins. And I think you're really right about we we have to be, I suppose, grateful um, that we are in a slightly better position with the people that we can see and the things that we can do this time. Um, but just coming to you, Sarah, um, how, you know, how can we still be looking out for our staff? We are still mostly remote. I know you're dealing with people all across the globe. Um, how are people managing to look out for each other when once again, they're not physically seeing each other? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, we um, are a very international company, um, as I'm sure many are out there. We, we have people um, dotted all over the globe and therefore many people many managers who are managing people who aren't co-located um, with them. Um, and, and that's the same now for every team, even if before all of your people were physically together in the office with you, you've almost now become an international manager by default because <laughs> everybody's not in the same location as you. I think it's it's really important to um, you know up those open and honest conversations um, about how people are feeling and what support and help they need, being proactive in terms of mentioning it asking about it don't wait for somebody in your team if you're a manager or a colleague to sort of say oh i'm really struggling actually proactively ask about it and proactively suggest things that that they might need to do we all know that we all know in theory all the things that we should and shouldn't be doing but actually getting them done making them making time for those in each day is, is really really difficult sometimes and so making time in one-to-ones to have that that check-in but also thinking about all the other things that we would do at this time of year I know in many organizations there would be Christmas parties there would be you know holiday uh, get-togethers there would be meals out for a team have a think about ways that you can do that virtually yes it's not the same but that doesn't mean that just because it can't be exactly the same we shouldn't do it at all um, I know some teams who are um, each going to order takeaway um, you know from Deliveroo or whoever um, in their respective homes and they're going to have a Zoom Christmas meal um, and I just think that's that's a lovely way of not just resigning to yourself to the fact that all the Christmas drinks and so forth can't happen but that there's ways around it and keeping that connection that social connection with your colleagues is really really important as well as just getting on the standard Zoom calls for all of your meetings. Again, really helpful and, and very practical. Uh, Monica, are there ways in which you are um, supporting your staff, keeping them motivated at this time? I, the one big factor is the connection that we've just heard about, regular connections with your manager and regular connections with team members. I think secondly, what's, what's really powerful is recognising people. And sometimes when we're stressed or we've got a lot more pressure and we're among these times it can be easy to fall by the wayside but I think um, giving positive feedback to somebody who's done a really good job can make such a difference to their well-being to give you an example last week I had an, uh, somebody emailed me about something that I'd done and they said that I'd done a brilliant job and it was totally unexpected and it really raised my morale significantly so I would say that the remembering to, to praise and to recognize our people it is a, is really important and and never has there been a more important time to do that than now excellent no that, that's a, a really valid point and um, tony i just want to turn to you um at the conference itself um we've got um uh, your managing partner gareth price speaking at the conference um with all senior leaders and, and ceos what role do you think that um, senior leadership should be taking at this time? I, is it a different level to last time? Is it the same messaging? What, what, what recommendations for senior leaders do you have? Um, I mean, one of the things that we've seen which has been really successful is our senior partner has done a blog uh, and he's done it. He started it in March and he's continued it all the way through. And um, he's talked about his own personal experiences, both at home and work and how he sees the market developing, etc. And I know that our people have really, really enjoyed reading those. I think it, they feel that they've got to know him better. Um, and given we're an international firm, obviously, we've got people in, in sort of over 40 different locations. 
So they've really enjoyed that. And other leaders in our international offices have sort of replicated that. And some of them have done, you know, video blogs. And I know a couple of our offices have even had um, they've done sort of through the keyhole with some of the partners homes. Um, so definitely, I think people have got to know their leaders better. And I think that really helps with morale. And with the senior partners blog, he has received so many stories from people just sharing, you know, their experiences, which he's then been able to take and sort of refer to in in future blogs. So I think, um, I think, you know, that is very, very important for people to feel that we're all in this together and we're going through it together. Yeah, I love that idea. That's that's really great. Um, so we're shortly going to sort of open up for questions from the audience in a minute. So just to um, remind everyone, if they want to send in a question, um, now is the time to do so. Um, Sarah, I wanted to ask you, um, also at the conference, you are facilitating a session all about loneliness. And I know, as Tony you know, rightly reminded us, that you can now go for a walk or whatever with somebody else, um, or, you know, meet somebody from a different household outside. But that doesn't mean that people are getting lonely, still working day in, day out at home um, during these times, perhaps on their own. Um, any suggestions on, you know, even for people to help themselves, not only just putting it all on the manager, but, you know, helping themselves to stay motivated and, and mentally um, uh, well? Yeah, I think um, loneliness and, and isolation is is something that we really need to, to think about going into this second lockdown period. Actually, not just for people. I think when we think about loneliness and isolation, we often think about people who are on their own. You can feel incredibly lonely, even in a house full of people, um, even with you know a spouse there, children there, perhaps you're living with flatmates, you can still feel incredibly lonely. So I think it's really important for, for managers and colleagues to, to kind of remember that and, and don't just be worried from a, a loneliness point of view of people who are living on their own. Obviously it does affect those living on their own in, in a different way. And we know that also this Christmas period that's coming up, I'm sure you all remember that every year there's a lot of campaigns um, by organisations um, such as Age UK about the loneliness that people are facing at Christmas and that could end up being even more acute um, this year uh, as, as well. Um, so I think in terms of making the use of that extra little bit of contact that we have now um, with being able to meet one person um, outside, even if you can't physically meet somebody else outside because you don't live near to, to your friends or whatever, um, we were talking before about having a phone call. So combine your exercise and that contact with, with somebody um, at the same time. There's also a lot of interesting research showing that it's not just about the number of contacts and, that you have that help with isolation, but the variety of contacts you have, the, the diversity, if you will, of contacts that you have. So um, it, it's better to phone a different person five days in a row than the same person five days in a row. That actually combats isolation and loneliness, um, even in a virtual world. Um, that combats um, isolation and loneliness as well. So yeah, don't don't just think about the the number of times you could meet somebody or call somebody, but but the actual variety of people that you're able to connect with as well. Again, hugely useful and practical information coming here. And um, so thank you, Susie, uh, Susie, Sarah. Sorry, <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Um, Monica, just also turning to you with regards to the conference. I mean, you are talking at the conference about why are we still having this mental health conversation? Well, this lockdown is proving exactly why. Um, but perhaps you'll talk about a little bit about what you're talking about and why mental health at this time is just so important. Sure. Thanks, Zoe. Um, we're seeing more and more companies setting an ambition around workplace mental health. And so my talk is really going to be around what are the barriers to realising that ambition and how can we overcome some of those barriers so what's GSK doing to overcome some of those barriers with a view to helping those companies to move forward with progressing their agenda 
Okay, great. Um, so I'm just going to have a look at the questions that are coming through. So while I'm just having a quick look at them, it's opposed to you. Um, for everybody who wants to know a little bit more about what's coming up in the conference in about two weeks' time, please take a look at this. that we start this momentum where we just take mental health more seriously. There's still a stigma about mental health. We are chipping away at it, but that wall needs to be smashed down. And this is a fantastic forum for, for beating the stigma of mental health. That looks exciting. <laughs> um, so, yes, we've had quite a few um, questions coming in here. So, I'm just, um, apologies, I'm looking down. I'm just looking at all the questions. So, um, I think, um, Tony, I'm just going to start with you with this question, but um, open for anybody else as well. Um, somebody has said, um, I'm at quite a junior level and don't believe my company have been supporting us. Um, enough when it comes to mental health. I can't leave my job now for understandable reasons. Just feel a little scared to approach anyone about it. What are your thoughts? Well, that sounds like a really tough situation to, to be in. Um, I mean, I, I would say, first of all, if you can share with somebody, even if it's not someone at your workplace, even just being able to talk through with someone else some of the things that you're feeling and thinking uh, can help you to sort of make sense of them and to sort of make a plan around what you might do and then secondly um, you don't necessarily have to approach um, your line manager you could talk to your HR team if you feel that you know them uh, well enough and they will always be supportive and they should treat your conversation in confidence um, so you could try doing that. And what what I found is that once, you know, if an employer doesn't know there's an issue, they can't do anything about it. In my experience, once they understand what the issue is, they will generally try to help. So it might feel like a really big step to actually go and speak to someone. But if there is somebody either in the HR team maybe in a different part of the business so that they're slightly more independent, um, that you can, you know, just take that first step, then, you know, I would suggest you do that. Other alternatives, and it depends on your employer, but you may have an EAP in place. So you might be able to call the EAP line and that will also be confidential. There may also be uh, other organisations. So, for example, for us in the legal profession, there's a, an organisation called Law Care, and they literally specialise in sort of providing support for people in the legal profession, not just lawyers, but anyone working in that industry. So it's worth finding out if there are things like that, too, and places you could go where you could speak to other people. OK, great. Um, do either of you want to add to that? So I'd just say, um, you know, try to ask some questions, have some conversations to perhaps understand and dig a little bit more in terms of where the hesitancy to offer more support might be coming from. Um, you know, as Tony Tony said, um, get some get some allies around you, but try and ask some questions. Is it perhaps um, a fear that it's going to cost a lot of money to help? Um, in which case, go and research some free things that you could suggest. Is it a lack of time? Um, you know, the whoever might be responsible for this feels that they, they just wouldn't have time to put everything together. So, again, perhaps you can gather together a group of, of volunteers and allies and say, we, we can help you. We can help you with this. So I think trying to understand where the hesitancy is coming from could maybe provide some useful answers as well. 
Great idea. Um, I, I've got lots of questions coming in here, so apologies if I'm looking down. But um, Monica, I'd like to come to you on this one. Um, wow. as, said, as a business services manager, I find it hard to check in on people without feeling like I'm micromanaging and checking up on people. What's the best way to do this? Great question. Um, thank you. What I would suggest is that you have a conversation with each individual separately and ask them how they would like to to be how they would like their channels of communication with you um, and, and often that can be a really non-threatening way to find out what works for them as opposed to feeling like you're encroaching um, and potentially micromanaging so have a conversation early on I, I, you know I really want to connect with you what's the what's the best frequency uh, duration um, and was, is it Zoom? Is it walk and talk? So as you, the more input you get from your employee, the more, the, the less likely you will feel uncomfortable about reaching out to them. Yes. Okay, great. Um, and, and to Sarah, um, I'm going to ask, ask this. Sorry, I just really need to have my glasses on. Um, it, the question is, um, have you got any practical tips for supporting employees in creating better boundaries um, between work and home. Remote working seems to mean that working day is getting longer and longer. Yeah, so I, I think there's there's two responsibilities here. I think there's the responsibility of the organisation and doing what they can in terms of setting parameters and structures and, and just a general culture within each team about what's, what's expected and, and more importantly, what's not expected. And then I think there's the, the, the responsibility of self. I know when I've ended up working longer hours, um, frankly, it's mostly down to pressure that I'm putting on myself rather than you know my boss overtly or or not saying oh you must you know do these extra hours it's, it's totally down to me and you do therefore have to be really strict with yourself um i have particularly because i cover europe middle east africa and asia pacific and my company is headquartered in the us you can imagine that my day could end up being really really quite long and so i i, I have sort of sacred hours where i unless you know, the world was about to collapse, I will never agree to have a call or a meeting during those sacred hours. Now, I'm different to Tony in that I'm much more of a night owl. So where needed, I'm happy to go into my evening and I would much prefer to do that than have to get up at 6 a.m. for something. But I talk about that uh, and I talk about that openly with everybody. Everybody knows where, what my sacred hours are. Um, and I find if you're more open with yourself about what thinking about what those boundaries are and then communicating those with with people they know that if they need to they can step into my evening but it's got to be really really super important if they want to step into my morning and that could be completely different for for somebody else so i think you have to set those boundaries um, and reinforce them with people as much as you can Yes, okay, thank you, um, thank you for that. Um, Tony um, and Monica, I'm gonna to come to both of you on this one. Um, I think you'll, you'll both recognize um, the importance of this question. Um, somebody says, how can we raise the subject of burnout with colleagues? Those most likely to be at risk will often be in denial or not want to acknowledge how they're feeling with colleagues. Tony, you know, you work with partners in a very um, stressful environment, billable minutes. This must be something that potentially you, you come across. Yeah, I, I think, um, yeah, definitely. I think people, part of it is about sort of education and helping people to, uh, you know, before they get to that point, helping people to understand and recognise possible signs and symptoms in themselves and also in their colleagues potentially. Um, interestingly, one of the first things we did when we started doing mental health first aid training a couple of years ago, we trained quite a few of our PAs in our London office because we felt that they were kind of at the center of a lot of the, the, the teams and were quite well placed to sort of notice if somebody appeared to be struggling a little bit. Um, if, if you're trying to approach somebody and they're not sort of forthcoming, it is quite difficult. Um, I think you can 
you can approach someone and you can say what you have seen. So um, I noticed that, uh, you know, on, and I know it's difficult because we're virtual, but you can still see people's faces and see some of their body language. You know, I noticed that on our call the other day, uh, you know, you didn't seem like yourself or you didn't, you know, you didn't join in the conversation. Is everything OK? And people might not open up straight away. But if you can leave the door open so that they they know that you can that they can talk to you then they're likely to kind of come back sorry my siri just went off in the background <laughs> it's fine didn't hear a thing um <laughs> monica is there anything you would like to add to that i would uh, i would say that some of our resilience programs and, and a lot of our employees have been through them um, we really talk about symptoms so what do you like when you're at your best what do you like when you're about to tip over the edge and so i agree that education and training is is really self-awareness is the key through the training that we provide so if people can themselves identify those signs that's obviously um, ideal but obviously obviously sometimes people are so in that zone that they don't really see themselves as struggling and so it's really important for other our colleagues or our managers to to look out for any changes in behavior or performance and and talk to those people early on so yeah couldn't agree more with what tony said and also i think the importance of 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 educating people at scale about those warning signs that they may have uh, and Monica, just staying with you for a second, somebody has asked, um, any ideas on additional things to consider, think about regarding winter well-being now? It's a really good point. Um, I'm personally um, struggling with going out. In, in, the, in, the, in the summer, I would go for a walk at 8 p.m. sometimes, and it was still really light and very mild. And now it's so much earlier that we're experiencing the darkness, and the cold and it's often raining but one thing that I've committed to is actually going out irrespective of the weather because you know we can all get a bigger umbrella and we can all get Wellington boots so why not go and do that for a change of scene so I, I really do think that we need to do that but I really liked what, what you said earlier Zoe about other companies encouraging people to go out in the day so where you can uh, have autonomy over how you work, work, I recommend that you do block out an hour in the daytime to get that daylight um, and then make that time up later on. Yeah, no, brilliant. Um, okay, so I think, um, Sarah, I'm gonna come to you for this one and we've probably got time for one more after this. Um, a lot of companies have made cuts. How can you recommend ensuring that teams are not feeling overwhelmed even though teams have extensive SLAs, the teams still are taking on this pressure today. It's a very good point. Yeah, it, it, it is. And, and it's another reality of, of this pandemic um, that a lot of individuals are, are facing. You know, many people have, have lost their jobs or had their hours reduced or their contracts significantly changed already. And there's no doubt that we're going to see more of that as the global economy <laughs> continues to, you know, to struggle. I think it's really important, um, particularly for managers and teams, to get out in front of that to almost address the elephant in the room obviously they're not necessarily going to have information that they can they can share but just to to, to actually bring out in team meetings in one-to-ones to say I, I, I know we're all worried at the moment about the economy about jobs and so forth and and actually give people almost the the permission to talk about that and the permission to talk about the fears that they may may have around that even if there's no immediate solutions or, or, or reassurance that they can give um just just talking about it rather than leaving it as the sort of elephant in the room i think is is really really important and just being aware that that will increase as we get to, to year end we've spoken about burnout <laughs> adrenaline and so forth as well those usually become more um critical in the normal year um, and they will be even more so uh, you know it felt even more so um, this year, so just be be aware. I'm I am particularly worried about uh, the mental health in in organisations when we come back in January. I think a lot of people are 
hanging on at the moment, frankly, for the end of the year, hanging on for that week or two that, that many people are able to take as, as, as annual leave in, in the Christmas New Year period. And I think a lot of people consciously or unconsciously are, are pinning a lot of hope on that being the rest that they need to get themselves, um, you know, back back on track again, mentally and physically. Um, and I worry that this lockdown period and everything that's surrounding the pandemic means that it actually won't be that mental health break that we're perhaps hoping that it all will be. Uh, I think you make a very, very good point there. And that's probably, you know, a really good discussion for us to have in January about to, how to get everybody back on track where perhaps the break hasn't been as, as, as much of a break as it would have been previously. So just looking at some of the sort of positive comments that have come in um, to say, love the idea of virtual Christmas party, using Zoom or Microsoft Teams for regular social interaction is important. We always have a virtual coffee corner. So that's nice to know. Somebody has said, um, uh, somebody has just said they're using their um, champions, oh, I've just lost it, um, that they're using their champions in a really positive way to interact with everybody so much more than they ever have done. Um, and that's been proving to be really useful. Um, but thank you, everyone. I think we've had a really great um, conversation today. Um, we've had nearly 300 people um, today watching on LinkedIn, YouTube, and Facebook. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, to Monica, to Tony and to Sarah, thank you so much for your time today, uh, for answering questions and giving your points of view. Um, it's been great having you and thank you everybody else for joining us and answering, asking questions. We look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks at the conference.